Congresswoman Herrera Butler, hello to you there in D.C. Welcome back to Straight Talk. Good to be here. Well, let's talk about the race. There are nine candidates in this race, and observers say you could be more vulnerable in this race than in any you faced since being elected. You broke party ranks and voted to impeach President Trump, one of only 10 Republicans who did, and it made many conservatives angry and emboldened some of your opponents. You were outspoken about the former president's actions. Do you stand by your vote? Oh, I do. I wouldn't change it. Um, I think I would, I would, had I understood what people didn't know and see here at the time, I, I would have um, probably worked more or, or attempted to uh, on the communications front. I didn't understand that people hadn't seen, um, you know, police officers being beaten with Blue Lives Matter flagpoles. I didn't know that people hadn't seen officers being drugged into a crowd and tased. I, I, I assumed that that was being seen all over. Um, but yeah, I did what I felt like I needed to do uh, per my oath of office. Um, it definitely, uh, as you noted, has caused me to get some primary challengers. But I also feel like um, this is exactly what someone, I, as, as a conservative who grew up in this district, would expect from someone in, it, who, who is my elected official, who believes in their oath and who maybe doesn't agree with me on everything, but I know is going to go to bat irrespective to do what they think is right. And that's what I've done in this district. And I'm hopeful uh, that voters will see the efforts and the value add that we bring. I do think still, even though people may disagree with me on that vote, um, I'm the best fit for this district, whether it's on the economy, whether it's on health care, whether it's on local issues like preserving our salmon runs or protecting us against an I-5 bridge that may or may not meet our needs. Those are all the things that I've fought for and will continue to do so if they give me their vote. Viewers are going to hear from challenger Joe Kent next. I spoke with him earlier and he questioned what evidence your vote to impeach Donald Trump was based on. Do you have a response for that? Well, so under, if, if you understand the Constitution, you understand that there's two parts to it, someone being removed from office. There's impeachment and there's the conviction in the Senate. The impeachment isn't a conviction. It is akin to a grand jury. It's saying we think there's enough evidence to investigate. We're going to send it on to the Senate for a conviction or not a conviction. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I based it on the things I saw and experienced, the people I talked to. I had texted Mark Meadows that day and said, why did I just see Joe Biden on <laughs> before I saw you know, the president on? Um, and the first person conversations I had with the security officers, with the officers on the ground, with members of Congress who were essentially battling with protesters through, through glass, um, I saw all the evidence that I need. I lived through it. And so I had enough. I felt like there was enough there to forward to the Senate for consideration of a trial. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. They think impeachment means, oh, you're done. Impeachment is like a grand jury. It simply means there's more here to investigate. President Trump has endorsed Joe Kent, and pundits say your race and that of Congressman Dan Newhouse of Sunnyside, Washington, who also voted to impeach, could signal the direction of the Republican Party and whether those who oppose Trump's influence have a place in it. Do you think you and other more moderates still have a place in the Republican Party? I think what you say in the first part is true. This race will be looked at as whether or not President Trump or former President Trump um, has control over the party, which I, I, you know, I look at this district, it's a swing district. It's independent minded. I would argue it's right of center. You know, this is where my values were shaped, but you know, they, a lot of people are looking at how this comes out and what it will mean. Um, but do I think, so I, I would challenge the title moderate. Um, you know, I've never voted for a tax increase. I've, I have strongly supported our second amendment rights. Um, I am pro-life. I do believe that um, you know families deserve the ability to to raise themselves free of you know too much government interference. But I've always been those things. The reason I think you you and others give me that title is because I also get stuff done. <laughs> you know, I also really want to make sure that my sea lion legislation gets signed into law, that my maternal mortality legislation to bring down the incidence of moms dying in America as a result of, of childbirth. I want to see that happen. That's why I've been. Um, given awards as a champion of children's health because I've gone to bat for low-income children in our area and across this nation. I actually believe you can still be a conservative. Conservative, You have to be willing to stand up for the truth, but you also need to want to get things done. You know, just gumming up the process here to make a name for yourself on social media is not what I'm in this for. It's too long of a commute. And I love Southwest Washington. It is an honor for me to come out here and to spend time fighting on behalf of my countrymen. 
I hope I get the chance to keep doing that. Viewers have seen a whole lot of TV ads recently about this issue. You've taken your opponent, Joe Kent, to task for suggesting the benefit eligibility age for Social Security should be raised. He says it would only apply to younger Americans and that you don't have a plan to keep Social Security solvent so retirees don't see their benefits cut later as Social Security runs out of money around 2034. What, what is your plan? Well, my plan is to oppose trillions in wasteful spending. That's part of the reason I had to oppose some of the bills that came for it just in this last year. Not that they were for bad things necessarily, right? But when you're staring at an economy and a recession, an economy that's on the verge of recession and 40 year high inflation, you can't spend your way out of that. And so it takes someone who's willing to push back, whether it's on Democrats or Republicans, I've demonstrated I'm willing to stand up to both parties. And I think that's a big part of securing Social Security and not pulling money out of it now to spend on other wish lists. And my opponent says he, oh, he that's not, you know, he's it, since I called him out on it, he's moved stuff off of his website that says he's not going to try and endanger Social Security. But he has said multiple times, he is as recently as about a week ago, he wants to privatize Social Security. Well, the stock market has taken about a 20% hit just in the last oh, several weeks. Imagine if he was in charge and he had put your social security in, he had privatized it. If you were on a fixed income, you certainly wouldn't be able to pay for gas or groceries or food. I mean, for the most part, even folks who are not on a fixed income are struggling with those things, which is why um, I've been ranked as one of the most effective lawmakers in Washington state because I've gone to bat to, to reduce the cost of gas by supporting legislation that makes us produce more here locally. And I've also worked on making sure our supply chains get back in order so that when you do get to the grocery store, the infant formula or the items that you need are on the shelves. So I think this race really is about, do you want someone to go to bat for you who you may agree with sometimes on some things and you may not, but who is going to honestly fight for you, who is one of you, and who listens to you. And I think, um, you know, I'm not trying to make, come at this. I think I look at each of those opponents and whether they're basing it on, you know, false claims about an election um, or they just want to be famous. I, I, I just think my area is too good for that. <laughs> I want so much more for the folks in this region because ultimately this is where I live and this is where I'm raising my kids. And I want my grandkids to be able to find work in here and stay here as well. This, this ties into the previous question about Social Security. Um, ac according to an Elway Crosscut poll, inflation is the number one issue for Washington residents. Inflation has grown 9.1 percent between June of last year and June of this year, a 40 year high. What other actions would you support to rein in inflation? Do you have a post pandemic recovery effort plan? Well, some of it, it's not going to be as fun as during the pandemic, right? And I, when I say fun, I say that very tongue in cheek. The pandemic was is something that we're all anxious to leave in our, in our rear view mirror. But we're not going to be able to do some of the spending that took place during the pandemic. That was emergency spending. And I almost liken it to having a patient on the table. <laughs> you got to stop the bleeding before you can then deal with other challenges in that patient system. Well, that was what happened during the pandemic. We did spend a lot of money. And part of that was to address immediate supply chain shortages for things like face masks and vaccine production. That was necessary and it was actually very bipartisan. Fast forward to the year, this last year, and I, I would argue to folks, you know, Washington state and federally, one party is in control of all of the levers. And, and how is it working? That's why I've opposed the, spend, the spending bills that have come forward in the last year. Not because again, there were horrible things in all of them, but because when you spend to the tune of trillions, you hyperinflate the economy and you see the 40 year high. I think they're expecting right now the average family to pay $5,200 a month in inflationary costs. And that's one of the reasons I'd say, even if you agree with my Democrat opponent on things, you shouldn't put her in Congress right now. You should bring balance to Congress by sending a Republican. And then I would say to the folks on the right, if you want a Republican who's going to get things done for you, you want someone who has a record of never raising taxes, who has records uh, of accomplishing things even across the aisle, but that benefit our region economically. Congresswoman, you've been consistent in your right to life stance over the years following the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade, giving states the authority now to restrict or ban abortion. Do you want to see that go even further? If it came up in Congress, would you vote for a federal ban on abortion? The reality is, is Joe Biden is not going to sign a federal ban. So I know that there are efforts right now, I think, to scare and to fear monger um, voters with this issue. 
take take one step back and breathe. Um, right now in Washington State, all of my constituents have the same rights they had before that they do now. Um, and I don't see with the Democratic governor and uh, with the majorities in Washington as they are, I don't see that changing. But well, you what are if it right. does, What if it I does change, though, um, in the next election and you're in Congress? Would you vote for a ban with a Republican president? As much as I'd like to see Joe Biden not be the president of the United States, he's still going to be the president of the United States after this election. I'm talking about in two years, if you're still there and you have a Republican president, would you vote for a federal ban? In two years, <laughs> if I make it through this primary, let's have that conversation. Okay, well, we'll, we'll hold you to that and we'll talk about it later. Uh, following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, there's concern among some that same-sex marriage could be in jeopardy. And last week, the House passed a bill titled Respect for Marriage Act, which would enshrine that right to same-sex and interracial marriages into federal law. You were one of 47 Republicans who didn't vote for that bill. Why not? Um, Actually, the numbers are, are flipped, um, but uh, this is an incredibly important issue, and it's one that I haven't, you know, we talk a little bit about, about the abortion issue. That's one where voters have known and seen where I've been at, and this is probably, I think, one of the first times I've voted on it, or it's come before me while I've been in Congress. And I think the number one thing I need people to know is, um, man, I wouldn't want to hurt anybody <laughs> in my state or in another state. And this is an issue that has very strong feelings on, on all sides, um, and I was incredibly frustrated with what I felt like was the gimmickry of the bill. It came, I had less than like two hours to even look at it, and that was during a full day of votes. I had no ability, I said, well, has it gone through committee? Have there been any hearings? Is there any testimony? Can anybody tell me what's gonna happen? I think there's over 30 states right now who have either other bills or, or, or laws on the books that are in somehow contravention with this. Um, can anybody tell me what's going to happen when this goes through? And nothing, which was frustrating because I feel like I could have gotten to a place where this would have been something I would have considered. But because I don't even think the Democrats, I think it was they were just wanting to, to ram it through and create some division. Um, I don't even think they thought anybody would support it. So I voted no because if you're going to change over half the laws of over half the states in the union, you need to know what you're doing. You need to know what the consequences are. I don't think that the federal government should be involved in marriage. I, that's not my interest. And voters can look at my record through this time. I haven't, you know, that, that's just not where I've spent my time, really focused on our economy. But this was not, I'm not going to pretend like this was an easier cut and dry vote for me. I really felt um, like if I hadn't seen this gone through the committee process and I could have asked questions. Um, and it could have been a part of it, there's a chance we could have gotten there. But I didn't, that wasn't, that wasn't the vote for me. It was up or down, and that's how it goes here in Congress. And I have to note that there are people that are really concerned because a concurring opinion by Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas did call the court to reconsider all of the court's substantive due process precedents, which included contraception and state sodomy oh. laws. So uh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, in, in part because I forgot to make that point. That was another part of my decision was there, I know you're bringing up Clarence Thomas, who is in a minority opinion, but the majority of this very conservative court in the Dobbs opinion specifically say, essentially, that this opinion should in no way be applied to the same-sex marriage ruling. So for the majority of this court, the issue of marriage is a settled issue. That was the other thing in my mind. I thought, why are they rushing this through? There is no change even on the horizon. And again, I would argue for Washington State, um, no change for my constituents in this area. So that also gave me some flexibility and weight. I need to know what I'm doing. There is nothing happening right now. Nobody's in my area is going to, it's not going to be a change for them. So let's do this right. That's the other thing. If people want to see um, a change, a really significant change come, you have to win hearts and minds. One of the things I've noticed as I've been here, um, majorities come and go and they can, you know, make a show vote over anything. But if you really want an issue, any issue changed, you really have to bring people along. You can't ram something like this through. Congresswoman, I know there's some votes that are going to be called soon, so your time is limited. I want to give you, you know, 30 seconds or so for a final message you would like to leave with Southwest Washington residents as they prepare to vote in Tuesday's primary. Thank you. It is an honor to serve Southwest Washington in Congress. 
uh, having grown up here and now raising my kids here, I want to make sure that we can continue to be a place where you can raise your family, you can find good employment, you can run your own business, or you can chase your dream. Right now, um, being a single party control in Washington, D.C., I think we need a check and a balance. We need someone who's demonstrated an ability to stand up to either party in the best interests of her constituents, whether it's sea lions or being anti-tax or promoting jobs and economic growth or protecting Social Security and Medicare. I am that candidate and I ask for your vote. Thank you, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler for joining us here on Straight Talk. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you too.